Hi, good morning, and thank you all for coming. As your Premier, I want to address directly with you about where we are as a country. The events that transpired last Friday and the disturbing images that we have witnessed have been forever and sadly etched in our minds. As a Bermudian, these images were extremely hurtful for me to see. It was reminiscent of our time in history when we were extremely divided. And this is not who we are, and this is not who we want to be. We may have different aspirations and different backgrounds, but we share common bonds. We are neighbors, co-workers, colleagues, and friends. We are Bermudians. And that is why it has been very difficult for me to find the right words to express my feelings about what took place. Because like all of you, I love my country. I realize that those of us who disagree politically have a fundamental right to express those views in a peaceful and legal manner. And despite our differences in our political ideologies, we must commit to the democratic process. Democracy must always win. Not party, not politics, but the process of democracy. That is a lesson we teach our children. We teach them about respect, no matter what the differences of opinion. And even then, with all the lessons that we try to teach our children, while they may listen to what we have to say, they definitely watch what we do. Our children are watching Bermuda. They are watching us make decisions, how we deal with our disagreements, and of course, how we lead and govern our country. That's why the events of last Friday were so upsetting, because whether you were a demonstrator, police officer, or parliamentarian, we are all Bermudians. And for our children's sake, we cannot let civility be threatened in a way that diminishes respect for each other. Our goal in proposing a new airport wasn't to divide us, but to bring us together in the construction of a world-class airport of which all Bermudians can be proud. For most people traveling to any country they visit, the airport is the first and the last thing that they experience. For Bermudians, it is also a vehicle that supports tourism and jobs. There's been a lot of talk about value for money. However, we've seen time in and time out again how the tender, the tender process has promised value for money, but instead brought anything but. It has brought cost overruns and concerns and delays. Port Royal saw an excess of $4 million overrun. Transport Control Department, $10 million. The Dame Lois Brown Evans Building, $20 million. The Heritage Wharf, $20 million, plus a $4 million repair fee. Barclay Institute, $55 million. Instead of value for money, Bermudians were hit with tens of millions in cost overruns just for these five projects alone, all paid for by us, the taxpayer. The opposition has called for returning to the same risk of delays and cost overruns that have plagued RFP projects in the past. Perhaps they say we should borrow 100 to 150 million to paint, patch, and repair an existing facility that is well past its prime. Perhaps delay the redevelopment of the airport for 10 years and then borrow 250 million to 350 or more to build a brand new terminal sometime down the road. Perhaps add another 350 to 500 million to Bermuda's already overburdened national debt and risk a downgrade of Bermuda's credit rating that would, of course, increase the cost of borrowing even more. We had to find a new way, a better way, and I believe that we have. It is an approach that has been endorsed by the British government. It has been endorsed by the Independent Airport Council International and the Bermuda Hotel Association. This is a creative approach that would deliver Bermuda's visitors and air travelers an innovative, modern, first-class airport and a guarantee for it to be on time and on budget. We have formulated an airport redevelopment plan that will create an environmentally friendly facility able to withstand damage from severe storms and hurricanes. The proposed new facility will provide wheelchair accessibility and enclosed passenger boarding bridges enhance passenger comfort through updated lounges and terminals, and the most importantly, 
create hundreds of jobs for Bermudians, boost our tourism, and provide millions of dollars to help rebuild our economy. Ultimately, and what is critical for the people to appreciate, is that ownership and control of the airport will remain with the Bermudian people. The funds that will be freed up with this very creative approach to building this new airport can be used in other areas, renovating our schools, introducing roadside sobriety or speed cameras, enabling the government to provide cost of living increases to our seniors, implementation of progressive payroll tax reform to ease the burden on lower income earners. All of this with no increase to our national debt or to the cost of debt service. As Premier, I recognize that tensions and emotions continue to be high. And as a responsible government, we must take every tangible step to cool those tensions. The events of last week were difficult for everyone across the island. In addition, I have been further troubled regarding the threats against my life. There is no place for hate or intolerance. I have and I will continue to engage with the opposition and implore them to find consideration for the sake of the country and all Bermudians. In that vein, I have had discussions with the opposition leader and the Speaker of the House, and it is agreed that we will not sit tomorrow and instead resume on February 3rd of 2017. We will use this time to calm, to heal, and of course to reflect on the meaning of this season that we enter. Peace, love, hope, and joy, the Christmas season. My fellow Bermudians, we come from a history of strength with some significant obstacles and challenges. But I know, together, we can rise out of this very divisive rhetoric that seeks only to define us by difference and not by commonalities. This is not a time for finger pointing. It's a time to join hands. It's an opportunity to heal those things that divide us. And there is no more powerful way to express our commitment to those ideals and of the highest standards of public service than leading by example. And that goes beyond working even more for the respect of each other. It's respecting the rule of law and democracy and the institutions that we entrust to uphold them. And importantly, respecting the rights of those who may disagree to express themselves in a peaceful and legal manner, while at the same time also respect the rights of other citizens who may not share the same view, but who elected us on both sides of the aisle to allow those of us serving in the People's House to do the work that we need for the good of all people. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Ms. Strangeways. Um, Mr. Cunningham, you said that um, democracy must win, but democracy isn't necessarily going to win tomorrow if lawmakers aren't going into the House. Should you have found a way to make sure that the House is back tomorrow? Uh, Sam, let me answer that question in this way, in that we've been meeting and discussing it through the week, and after meeting late yesterday with the Speaker and the opposition leader, it was agreed that we would go back on February 3rd. Sometimes in politics, to move forward, you have to compromise and collaborate, and that's what we will always continue to do. But what will happen on February the 3rd? What will have changed? Will MPs be able to debate on February the 3rd? Will it be able to get into the House? There are a lot of things that have to take place for February 3rd to be a good session of the House. First and foremost, it's the period of calm which I hope we have entered into now. Uh, secondly, it's, a, it's the continued period of collaboration and consultation which uh, we have committed to undertake. And just importantly with this bill, we continue to need to work so there's a better understanding of it and people have a clearer picture of what it entails. Yeah. And there has to be a genuine intent for everyone to participate for us to move forward. Okay, how are you going to, between now and February the 3rd, make people's understanding of the airport deal better? What will you do? You'll see in time. Okay, because that isn't that, that far away, really, is it? Um, can we go back to Friday? The day is a long time in politics. politics. Can we go back to last Friday? Yes, ma'am. Did you consider going out and speaking to the people who were on the hill? Um, I did, and I decided not to. Why? Because at that time, 
Um, I, was, I was in my office at 7.30, and when I walked in the office, there were only a few people at the gate. In fact, the police were, uh, the southern gate where I come out of the cabinet where I park, was, there was no one there. At 7.30, there were about six officers on the uh, gate on Parliament Street. Um, and a colleague of mine uh, walked into the house, I guess about 8 o'clock, and he said he was in the house. The next thing I knew uh, was when the Deputy Premier could not get in sometime after 8. At that time, I was trying to find out uh, what was going on, the, where the rest of my colleagues were. Um, I considered through the morning to go out there, but it was advised to me that it wouldn't be the appropriate thing to do. The, the crowd was not, the crowd was not uh, listening. The people there were not really listening to what was taking place. When members of parliament asked to walk in and get through and they're told you know, no or turn around, then it makes little sense to go out there and do what you have to do. And furthermore, Sam, let me answer it this way. All through um, the process of any government initiative, uh, I've always made myself very open to sit down and talk to people about these things. Uh, and that's not going to change. But it wouldn't have been, I don't think it would have been fruitful to go out and talk to the people at that time. Who advised you not to go out? I take advice from many different people. Or was it the police? Was there a safety police? I take advice from many different people. I walked around and, and, and got out of the office and got some fresh air later, so um, I don't think... Do that? Uh, quarter to 12, something like that. So were you watching when at one fifteen? Oh, sorry. Were you watching at one fifteen when the police wearing the, the helmets? No, I couldn't see anything couldn't from see my office. From where no, you were. no. And so, but you felt that you go in there, you couldn't have, as leader of the country, you couldn't have attempted to engage with the co-workers, neighbours, colleagues, friends who you've spoken of. Um, but let's be let's be very frank about this, Sam. Mm -hmm. Those people were there for a purpose, and they were not interested, in my humble opinion on dialogue at that point in time. But I'm happy to sit down at any time and have constructive dialogue. There's been, there was a press release at the moment. I'm sorry, I know this one as well. But there was a press release that the PLP put out last night. You may say you've already answered some of these questions, but it was basically trying to get to whether you knew about the use of the PSU, the police support unit, those officers who were armed with pepper spray. What conversations can you, can you tell us that you had with the police commissioner on Thursday night when it was known that a protest was going to happen? And during Friday? I had no conversations with the commissioner Thursday night. Um, the police operations, as the commissioner has said on at least two occasions since that time, are at the remit of the police. And so this government has never been involved in police operations. Um, I will say one thing, though. Um, pepper spray, I believe, has been carried by police officers since 2006. In fact, I was out uh, somewhere just two days ago, and I saw the pepper spray right there on the side of the police. I think it's standard, uh, standard use. So you were told basically before it was used? Excuse me? You were told that the PSU was going to be... I, I was not informed of police operations, and we don't at get any involved. Point, or there's, or at any point before 115? We don't get involved in the police operations. Brian, do you have something? Yes, please. Premier, um, was it frustrating for you as Premier of the country not to have a dialogue with the Commissioner over such an important decision? And would you like your Minister of... Uh, national security to be involved in some way? I think, Brian, at this time, you know, we're reflecting back on the uh, responsibilities uh, under our Constitution and the way we govern ourselves. I've been very clear since the time I was Minister of National Security what my responsibility is. I've never um, questioned the Commissioner in advance on what he's going to do. We were assured that the access will be allowed to the House. That didn't work. Um, we've asked the, the government house that there needs to be a full investigation into this matter and have been assured that that will take place. So you're supporting the speaker in his call for an independent inquiry? I said from the very start that there needs to be a full investigation. And I think it has to start with uh, people who believe that they were treated badly or wrongly or have a complaint to file that complaint. Because remember, we have an independent complete uh, police complaints authority that will review those. The police are also doing their investigation. I've made it clear to the governor that uh, there needs to be full understanding of what happened and we need to look at everything and we need to make sure that if there are any uh, challenges that arose from that they will be dealt with in the most appropriate way. It's too early to speculate on anything. We saw some very graphic and concerning images. Um, an investigation will take some time to do because I understand as was in the media, I haven't been informed, but there was a, a middle of this week, there were about 26 complaints made to the police complaints authority.
No, um, the overseas um, publicity, unfortunately, has not been particularly damaging, but if they hear that Parliament has been shut down by this protest for several months, will that not cause our rivals to, to, to um, look at us and point at us and say something's breaking down in Bermuda? I think that's one way people can look at it. I take, tend to look at it another way. We only had one session left in the House, and that would have been tomorrow. Um, and we're, we've planned to come back on February 3rd, two sessions before the budget. Um, and so I look at it a different way. It's necessary to do. Well, we could have tried to rush ahead, get into the House, had some challenges tomorrow. But there's too much angst in the community. And, you know, I live, I breathe, I walk in this community. I serve everyone in Bermuda. So I feel that pain. And while this decision might not be accepted by some in the community, this is the right decision at this time. And I think I've outlined the reasons why. Premier, this is the second time that the House of Assembly has been shut down by, by protesters. It is in contravention of the Parliament Act. Surely this cannot be allowed to continue. What is going to be done to prevent this happening going forward? Um, you are correct, and that is concern, and that's why during my conversations I focused in on uh, democracy and the right of people to protest uh, peacefully. Those questions should be answered by uh, the, the commissioner and uh, certainly by the governor who has direct responsibility. Surely those decisions will be made in consultation with yourself, the Speaker of the House, and possibly the Minister of National Security? Of course, yes. What you you, but if you look, um, you look at our House of Assembly, we, we're blessed in so many ways, uh, but that House of Assembly is probably, um, let's be real about it, the least secure parliament that I've ever been in, even for smaller countries. Um, and, you know, uh, I know members on both sides have been concerned for their safety. Um, and it's something that needs to be taken a look of. We're spoiled because we live in, in a relatively safe country, but that does not mean that we do not face the, the challenges and the scar that can come by demonstrations or by other violent attacks that Bermudians, unfortunately, uh, have to suffer under. But it's time to take a look at it, and we need to allow those who are paid to do that and who have the expertise and, and to come back and say that. You know, I, I've always felt very safe in Bermuda, but I have to tell you, uh, Saturday morning when I woke up and I got the death threats, um, I thought for a while. Not so much that somebody was going to try to do something to me, but because what, where are we as people? Where somebody would post something on social media, and I love social media. It's a great way to connect and, and communicate with people and look at information. But well, somebody would post something to, to, uh, against a sitting premier and just think it's the right thing to do. And so after I reflected on it for a while, I had full confidence in the Bermuda Police Service. I decided I was going to go about my duty because I will never be intimidated or have fear over those who try to create that. It would never happen. Did you have an armed escort at the boxing on Saturday night? That's a question you'll have to ask the police. Um, I was very comfortable at the boxing. It was a good event. I'd like to see it go a little longer. Um, but I'm not aware of uh, what type of security was there. I did have a special branch officer. I would doubt they were armed. Did your colleagues in the OB advise against having that sitting last Friday? Um, no, we were all for the sitting last Friday. And remember, we were... When, when it appeared or when it became apparent that things were about to escalate for that, there was no chance possibly of MPs being allowed to enter the house. I think the speaker called it off at that point. So the speaker made that decision, I believe. I'm asking because you will need to understand that your colleagues, uh, fellow OBA parliamentarians, suggested that, you know, mm -hmm. let's put this thing on hold until another day. And you, you opted to proceed with the hearing, with the sitting. No, that's, that's not correct. That's not correct. I mean, if you, want, if you want a full conversation on that, I need all the information. That's not a correct, because we were all in uh, the office together discussing things through. So decisions were made right in that office. There was no decision by one moving forward. What about the comments from uh, MPs Mark Pettengill and Leah Scott about them possibly se se uh, severing ties with the OB as a result of this situation? Um, those are unfortunate comments that were in the Royal Gazette. I've had conversations with my colleagues since that time. I think I'll answer the question by saying that when we have such a uh, disturbing 
uh, alarming and concerning incident that happens like that, all of us were shaken. And, you know, people were searching. People were searching. People wanted answers. And so um, I, I, was, I was disappointed in the comments, but they're my colleagues. I speak to them. I speak to them directly. I want to pick you back on something that Sam asked you. Why do you I don't know if that's fair. Why, why do you think as leader of this country you didn't have or you didn't have the wherewithal or the confidence to think that you could go out there and address those people despite their angst against the debate, debating of that hill? Uh, Gary, I could have gone out there. I could have gone out there and um, said some things, but at that time, people were there to demonstrate. They were not there to listen. And my door has never been closed to listen to people. And so go out there and just be part of the demonstration, listen to it, be subject to verbal abuse. That's, th that's really not worth it. That's not progress. You said in March, though, that lessons had been learned. It was kind of almost like a trial run of this in March when Parliament was shut down. You said afterwards, we're going to listen. Lessons have been learned. What lessons were applied this time that you learned from March? Well, um, I'll answer that question very simply in this way, that in, in politics, things change. And um, I believe that uh, what happened on Friday was a concerted, organized effort. Um, taking in tactics that are not acceptable in Bermuda. And I would hope the media would uncover some of those tactics and do the job that you, that you typically would like to do. What kind of Can tactics you, do, you, do you... I think, I think the, there were many demonstrators who came with a good intent to share their point, but I think there were other demonstrators who were rallied there and they knew exactly what they were getting into and they were advised how to act and how to conduct themselves. Um, and those type of tactics, I'm surprised the media is not investigating them fully. I'm not going to comment. I've seen emails going around. Are you able to follow those emails? Um, I follow them to some extent, yes. Um, what impact do you see this having on the OBE's chances of retaining the government at the next general election? Because people are already talking about, the, about that time and the impact that this is going to have. They're not going to forget come the time to cast their ballots? Obviously, these are tough times, and you know people do remember. Um, but we'll continue to work hard, and um, the fortunes do change. You can refer to every political election in history. Fortunes do change. Just look at Donald Trump. Two weeks out, he was so far beyond the polls, he couldn't even see in, he couldn't be seen in the rearview mirror. Now, that's a bad example, but it's an example. When did you first learn about the possible use of force by the PSU? I, I've already re replied to that question, but uh, and I'll and I'll reply again. Police operations are at the remit of the the, the commissioner and his team. That notwithstanding, don't you think that as premier of the country, had you been made aware of the possible use of force, you may have been able to intervene somehow, ask that I don't know, a cooling off period be allowed, or something along those lines? Look. Um, until we change the structure of responsibility in Bermuda, it's going to be very difficult for, for, to pick, choose, and refuse when you want to be involved. Now, you addressed the airport bill, which was the catalyst for the events of last week. <coughs> but it's those events and not the airport bill which are of concern to the public at the moment. And you more or less this morning only gave that, that the, the aftermath, the cursory glance. Why? The aftermath for, help of me out. The, the situation outside the House of Assembly. Oh, that's, I don't, I don't agree with that. This is the third time that I've spoken to that situation. This there. morning, you, went at, you spoke at length about the airport bill. No, I started uh, with my comments. That's right. I'll you give you a copy. You a no, I, I, I went into detail. Remember, Gary, this is the third time I've talked to it. I spoke on the Friday. Uh, there was a lot of information out then. Uh, I spoke on Monday, and I've spoken again today. Not a cursory grant. I take, I take exception to that. What happens to this bill? When will it be brought back? Will it What's, be on February? Will it be after the budget? It's still on the order paper, so we're going to continue to work and uh, get better understanding. All right, is your leadership... Oh, just one more. Question here, thank you. Yeah. Is your leadership within the party the threat? Every day is a threat in life. Has anyone within the parliamentary group asked you to consider stepping down? No. Are you aware of any potential challenges who are looking to actually... There's always people who want to sit in the Premier's chair. Right, um, Brian well, and then Gary Lass. For some reason, I don't know why. <laughs> well, one last question. There was a gazetting yesterday of the new regulations uh, with regard to the Civil Service Commission. 
Why did government choose to prematurely, according to a cabinet release, uh, gazette those regulations? I believe there was a press release put out yesterday which says it all. No, no it doesn't, Premier, because no. why would government do that if, if without, the, the word is that there wasn't any consultation with the senior civil servants that this thing had, that's, that there, that's, was ongoing, there was ongoing discussion, yeah. and they woke up yesterday to see that, to see the regulations in the gazette. There, um, let me be very clear that there's been ongoing discussion for some time about these regulations, probably two years uh, discussion about them. Um, and also let me be uh, clear that the PSC regulations fall underneath the remit of government house, not the government, but the government house has worked closely with us. So um, we put out a press release yesterday. Um, I'm well aware of the details of the situation now, and I'll work through uh, with, with uh, colleagues involved and the civil service and the government house to set it right. Those no, not at all. Not at all. Okay. Not at all. You know, accountability is very important, but uh, no. What are, the, what are the legislation, what are the bills are going to be postponed? What, what are they going to happen? Um, you're testing my memory here. The, there's gaming regulations, two pieces of gaming regulations, which are, um, there'll be some debate, but I, I think that uh, they deal with fees. Uh, there is a Quarantine Amendment Act. Um, there is an Immigration Act, which is, um, the opposition says it's not contentious, and there were two finance bills on uh, U.S. Bermuda Convention treaties, so they'll be updated. And we made the de those, those no, we made the decision. We made the decision that they can they can wait over. Are you securing your role as leader of the One Bermuda Alliance? I thought Sam already I'm answered that question. Are you securing your? There's always there's always challenges to any position in politics, but I'm not aware of anyone who has, wants me to move on at this point. So you haven't been approached by your Minister of Works and Engineering? No, no. 